Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I'd like to start uh, by thanking Jonathan and uh, Nancy Lee Kemper uh, for connecting the Smithsonian with the Kansas City Library. Uh, being here in Kansas is part of a broader and concerted effort to bring the Smithsonian to you, and we would not be able to do this without the support of, of friends like them. Um, I'd also like to thank Lisa Brower and the Linda Hall Library staff for organizing this lecture. Um, this is my first trip to Kansas City, and of course it's quite an exciting time to be here uh, with the baseball. And uh, I am a Washington Nationals fan, and because the San Francisco Giants knocked us out, um, I am all for the Royals, so <laughs> go Royals. <laughs> And you will not offend me one bit if you check your phone while I'm talking to see what the score is. And you might even let me know at some point. Okay. Um, I also know there are some Smithsonian friends uh, here in the audience today. Um, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for your support. And if you have a chance afterwards to come up and introduce yourselves, I'd be uh, glad to meet you. Okay, so... Um, when most people think about the Smithsonian, um, they think about our wonderful museums and exhibits in Washington, D.C. And we are, of course, very proud of those. Um, but the Smithsonian is much more than that. Um, we have more than 137 million objects in our archival collections, only a tiny fraction of which um, is ever on exhibit um, at a given time. Um, we have more than 175 affiliates scattered across the nation, including some right here in Kansas City. And um, behind the walls of our exhibits, um, we do an amazing amount of important scientific research. Um, so this evening, um, I'm going to tell you about some of the marine research that I've been doing uh, the past several years, um, focusing on tropical deep reefs, exploring the underexplored. So if you're not familiar with deep reefs, uh, these are natural extensions of shallow water coral reefs. And they extend from 150 to more than 1,000 feet. And globally, deep reefs may be the most diverse underexplored ecosystems in the ocean. So in 2011, I established the Smithsonian Deep Reef Observation Project, or I'll call DROP for short. Um, and this has now grown to include about 40 Smithsonian marine scientists and staff, as well as uh, external colleagues. Uh, our aim is to explore biodiversity and monitor uh, long-term conditions uh, on deep reefs. So we are focusing our research efforts in the Southern Caribbean, uh, specifically on the island of Curacao. And if you're not familiar with Curacao or haven't been there, you may be familiar with the blue Curacao liqueur, which is where the name <laughs> gets its name. So what gives us this unique opportunity to explore deep reefs off of Curacao is the availability of a privately owned manned submersible called the Curasub. Um, this vehicle is capable of descending to 1,000 feet, and it holds five people, four passengers and a pilot. So two people ride in the front. They lie on their stomachs on benches, and they look out of the, the front bubble. And then a pilot sits on a seat between their legs. And then there's a seat uh, behind the pilot where two people can sit, and there's a porthole on either side. So this submersible was originally designed for tourism, and it's still being used that way. Any of you can go down to Curacao, pay your money, and go for a dive in this sub. But it turns out to be a fantastic research vessel, and that's because the owner of the sub um, equipped it with hydraulic arms that we can use for collecting specimens. Um, it uh, has a high-definition video camera right here. Um, if we have time at the end, I'll show you a few clips from that camera. Um, it's capable of descending to 1,000 feet. Uh, there currently are no other research submersibles operating in the Caribbean, so this is a sole source situation. And finally, um, this sub offers very easy access to deep reefs. And that's because off of Curacao, uh, deep reefs occur very close to shore. So that turquoise water that you see is shallow, the dark water is deep. Um, the Curacao is based here at the Curacao Sea Aquarium, and this arrow here is where, uh, shows where the sub exits the boat slip, and then the drop-off is right there. 
So when it's time to dive, they wheel the sub out of this garage right here. They lift it with a crane. They place it in a boat slip designed especially for it. Um, the passengers climb in through a hatch door in the top, and then they close the hatch door. Out you go, <coughs> down you go, and within minutes, you can be at deep reef depths. Easiest sub diving in the world. So each dive for research is usually about three to four hours. I was in the sub one time for seven and a half hours, and as much as I love being in there, I can tell you that's too long. Um, <laughs> no bathrooms. But um, so when we're down there, we are um, we're taking video, we're taking still pictures, we're making notes, and of course we're collecting specimens. And the sub is equipped with a lot of tools that we can use for collecting uh, organisms. For sedentary things like sea urchins or sponges, we typically just scoop them up with the basket that's in the front of the sub. Um, one of the robotic arms has pinchers here that we can also use to pick things up and drop them into that basket. Uh, for fishes, which are my research uh, specialty, a little more incentive is required. Um, so this. So the, the right arm of the sub has what's called a quinaldine ejection system. And quinaldine is a fish anesthetic. So we can squirt some of this at a fish, it makes them sleepy, and then we suck them up in this blue hose, they go around here, and they end up in this canister. Um, and it works really well for, for small fishes. Now if we have big things, and we did get a two and a half foot shark with this sub one time, um, we can knock them out with the, with the, quinal, I'm sorry, with the quinaldine, and then scoop them up in the basket and then you see there's a, a door here that we can, uh, we can open and then drive the sub forward and push that fish into the back and it's like a little fish cage back there. So when we get back up to the surface, uh, we take everything that we've collected and we go to a little makeshift lab. This is a, a, an aquarium, it's not a research lab, but they've made a little uh, space for us to process our samples. Um, so we identify things, we measure them. Very importantly, we take a color photograph of the living color pattern. Um, closely related species often differ um, most obviously in their color pattern, but after we preserve specimens, they lose all their color. Um, so those, those photographs are very important. And then we take a tissue sample. Um, these samples are sent back to the Smithsonian, and one of them is immediately analyzed for DNA, and then the rest of that sample is put in the Smithsonian um, uh, permanent biorepository. And then we preserve the rest of the specimen and we ship them FedEx back to the Smithsonian where they get uh, archived into our permanent uh, collections. So what we're finding is a whole new world of biodiversity. Weird spiny crabs, gorgeous Gorgonian corals with intertwined brittle stars, jewel-like mollusks, Stunning coral colonies with peppermint striped shrimp and bizarre hermit crabs. These are called tusk shell hermits, and they each um, have one of the claws modified so that when this crab retreats into its tusk shell, that modified claw forms a perfect cover to the opening of the shell. We have a lot of new species that we've discovered submersible diving off of the Curacao Sea Aquarium. This is a new species of highly prized cone shell. Um, and this was actually named after one of our donors who has supported drop research and actually come down and participated in the sub diving. This is a new species of flame scallop um, from 900 to 1,000 feet. We always find it on these vertical walls. This is a new species of brittle star that's about the size of my little fingernail. And it's not only a new species, but it's the first record of this genus, Astrophiura, in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you're looking at the ventral or, or bottom surface here, and you can see the, the egg sacs, just like uh, uni in a sea urchin. And this is the top or dorsal view. But what's fascinating about this new species is that the only place that we have found it is 900 to 1,000 feet on man-made trash. So here it is, <laughs> here it is on a beer bottle, and here it is on a car tire. So we have no idea what the real habitat of this new species is. 
But we're going to go back to 900 to 1,000 feet and really start looking for this thing. It kind of stands out, you know, pretty well, even though it's really tiny. We have a lot of new species of fishes. I'll just show you a few. This is a new species of blenny, little small thing um, that a colleague and I described, and we named this one Drop Eye after the Drop Project. Um, we have several new species of beautiful little basslets of the genus Lipogramma. Um, they, uh, they make beautiful aquarium fish if you can get them up alive. And I will point out that the owner of the sub has figured out how to bring a lot of these deep things up um, alive by doing it over a period of many days. And he has um, some of the only deep reef fish uh, species in the world, uh, you know, in his exhibits in the aquarium. Um, this is a lovely new species of goby. Again, these are small little fishes. Um, uh, this is one of several new goby species, and this one's from uh, 350 to 400 feet. This is a gorgeous new species of sea bass, about this big, um, of the genus Antheus that, uh, that occurs between 800 and 1,000 feet. And this is a new species that a colleague and I described earlier this year, and we gave it the common name, the yellow spotted golden bass, and the scientific name, Lyopropoma ulnii. Um, it's from 600 to 800 feet, and it's part of a really interesting story that I'll tell you very quickly. Uh, several years ago, a colleague and I had discovered a young or larval stage of a, of a sea bass that was very perplexing to us. And, and the reason it was perplexing is that it has seven very elongate uh, dorsal fin rays. My colleague and I have studied sea bass larvae from all over the world, and we had never seen anything like this in any Atlantic species. Um, so we started describing this as a new species based only on the larval stage, and DNA confirmed that it was something different. Um, we actually had to take the right eyeball out of this tiny little fish and, and got a DNA sequence uh, from it, but it had no matches in our vast database of DNA sequences of shallow Atlantic fishes. However, when I added the DNA sequences for all the uh, deep reef fishes that we're collecting off Curacao, I found a match. The unknown larval fish from the Florida Straits um, is the young stage of the new species, Lyopropoma ulnii, um, collected 600, 800 feet clear across the Caribbean uh, off of Curacao. So thanks to um, exploratory <laughs> submersible diving and uh, DNA, we were able to match this larva with its prospective adult. And we thought Paul Simon's lyrics about mother and child reunion were the perfect epigraph for this story. Well, altogether we have at least 30 new species of fishes and invertebrates, and uh, I've just shown a few of them here. Um, this is remarkable. I mean, scientists have been studying the Caribbean for more than 150 years. Um, but what makes this even more amazing is that all of this new diversity was found in a tiny plot of water. The study site is only about one-tenth of a square mile. So I think you can see that if we're finding this much uh, new diversity in this tiny plot of water, that we've only scratched the surface in terms of understanding what lives on these deep reefs. And deep reefs uh, occur around the globe in, uh, in tropical areas. Um, so how much diversity are we missing? And why has science overlooked it in the past? Well, for one reason, we can't get to these depths using scuba gear. Um, with scuba gear, we can go to 120 feet, maybe 150 for a few minutes, um, but that's it. And if, like James Cameron, you've raised more than $5 million to build a sub that goes to the deepest point in the ocean, 36,000 feet, you're not stopping at 300 feet, 600 feet, uh, 900 feet. So, for more than five decades, these deep diving subs have just been zooming past these deep reefs <coughs> on their way to deeper depths. So it turns out that there is this zone between about 150 and 1,000 feet that science has missed in the past. Um, and it's just chock full of biodiversity and we need to keep exploring uh, these areas if we want to learn uh, what's living on our reefs. Well, the good news is that drop scientists now have the capability to start moving this sub around to explore uh, other Caribbean deep reefs. And that's because the owner of the sub a few years ago bought 
a former NOAA research vessel, the RV Chapman, and he's completely renovated it to serve as a sub hauler. Um, so he added a crane uh, to the ship and he can now carry the sub on the ship and when it's anchored, uh, he can then deploy and retrieve the uh, sub with the ship. So undoubtedly, as we start moving around to new sites, we're going to find more new biodiversity. Um, but these deep reefs deserve study for other reasons as well. And one, as Lisa mentioned, is that they may play a role in the survival of shallow reefs above. Um, you're probably aware that uh, shallow coral reefs are in peril worldwide. Um, this is particularly true uh, in the Caribbean. Um, but what's happening on deep reefs? We don't know. We know that shallow reefs and deep reefs are connected, but we really don't know what those connections are. So it seems possible that deep reefs could play a role in the survival of shallow reefs. Um, for uh, one scenario is that some shallow reef organisms might be able to hide out on deep reefs until conditions above improve. And it's also possible that uh, populations of some deep reef organisms might be able to reseed uh, shallow reefs when they've been impacted. So in addition to our biodiversity uh, studies, DROP has started some long-term monitoring off of Curacao. And one type of monitoring that we're doing is temperature. Uh, so we have 11 of these oceanographic temperature loggers. They're only about this big, about that big around. And we have deployed them on the reef slope off of the sea aquarium between 50 and 800 feet. Here's one at 400 feet. Um, in place, and we put some neoprene around them so they would, uh, they would stand upright. Um, we have programmed these to record temperature every minute, and then they stay out for a year, and after a year we bring them in, plug them into a computer. It takes about 30 seconds to download a year of data, and this is what the year one temperature data look like. Um, you're looking at all depths and all data combined, um, but every one of these colors represents a different depth. We're going deeper as you go down and colder um, as you go down. Uh, last month I was in Curacao and we retrieved the temperature loggers and downloaded year two data and we reprogrammed them and put them back out. So as I speak, they're out there recording temperature every minute. What's exciting about this is that we know a lot about how sea surface temperatures are changing and there has been a lot of monitoring of temperatures on shallow reefs in the Caribbean. But nobody has looked at what's happening with temperature on a vertical reef profile. Um, so this, this data set, uh, these data that you're looking at are actually the baseline data that will allow us to detect changes in the future on this vertical reef slope. Uh, another type of monitoring that we're doing um, is for uh, diversity and abundance of some reef organisms. And we are using these autonomous reef monitoring structures, or ARMS for short. Um, and these are basically little reef condominiums. Um, they're made of PVC plates stacked on top of one another. And you put them out on the reef and you leave them for a year. And all kinds of things settle on them and start growing. And so after a year, they start looking very much like the reef around them, which is the whole idea. So after a year, you can swim down um, and you take, we have a milk crate that's lined with fine mesh. We place it over the top of one of these, wrap it up with a bungee cord and swim it to the surface. And so now we have a sample of much, as what, of what, much of what is living on that reef without having to destroy the reef. And very importantly, every one of these arms units is made exactly the same way, the same number of PVC plates, they're all a cubic foot. And this gives us the standardization that we need to be able to detect changes in some reef biodiversity from place to place and over time. So in 2012, uh, DROP broke new ground by deploying some of these arms on deep reefs. Um, they have been used on shallow reefs in many parts of the world, and we put three of them out at 70 feet at scuba diving depths, but we also put three out at 180 feet, at 400 feet, and at 735 feet. And we did this by loading two at a time on the front basket of the sub. And then when we got down to depth, we used the hydraulic arm of the sub to deploy the arms on the bottom. 
So we left those for a year. Um, here's what three of them at 400 feet look like after six months. You can see a lot of you know little patches of things uh, starting to grow on these. And then in uh, August of 2013, um, we su successfully retrieved all of the deep water arms. And there, there was no guarantee that we were going to be able to do this because, as I said, when you um, are doing it with scuba gear, you simply swim down with this crate, place it on there, wrap a cord, and swim it up. But you can't do that with a sub. So what we did was we added some U-bolts uh, to the base plate of, this, uh, of the arms, and then we added latches to the milk crate. Um, so it, when we got down to depth, we would uh, just use the robotic arm of the sub to lift this lid up and then place it on one of the arms, um, push it down to engage that latch, and then pick it up. So we got all of them up, and the two scientists that are leading this part of the work, uh, Nancy Knowlton and Chris Meyer, were so excited about this opportunity to be able to start monitoring um, and the deep reef as well as the shallow that they tripled the number of arms that we have Alpha Curacao. So we now have 30 six of them out there, three transects, uh, four different devs. Processing these things is a lot of work. So we're going to be going back. We're going to leave these out for two years now because the settlement rate on them in the colder, deeper water is lower than it is in shallow. So um, in September of 2015, um, we'll go back and retrieve them. Um, processing involves taking the, each, one of, uh, each one of the units apart so that you end up with uh, just the individual plates and we photograph the top and the bottom. Here's what one of the plates looks like. They can be quite beautiful. Um, so what we do is we initially just take a, a, a small sample of everything that we can see that you know, looks different on here and we, uh, we get a DNA sequence for uh, those organisms. But then after we finish subsampling these plates, we literally scrape everything on that, uh, that's living on these plates, we scrape it off into a blender and we blend it up. And what we're doing is using the, the most state-of-the-art DNA technology called next-gen sequencing, which allows you to take a mixed sample and have it spit out a DNA sequence of every species that's in that sample. Um, <clears throat> it's just extraordinary. And so what, what that gives us is a, for each one of those arms, we have a little, uh, uh, we, we get a DNA sequence for everything that was living on it. And that, gives us what we need to be able to compare what's on one arms to one in another depth or one at another location. So we're very excited about uh, the, both the temperature and the arms work. And one of our long-term goals for uh, Curacao is that it will become um, an affiliate member of the Smithsonian's new Tenenbaum Marine Observatories Network. Uh, TMON, for short, uh, will comprise a, a global network of coastal sites for long-term monitoring of marine ecosystems. Uh, the first four permanent sites in this network are the Smithsonian's existing marine stations in Fort Pierce, Florida, on the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, uh, in uh, Caribou Cay, Belize in uh, Central America, and in Panama. But what Curacao offers that none of these uh, other sites offers is the ability not only to monitor changes in the shallow coastal ecosystem, um, but on a shallow to deep reef profile as well. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to turn now to one other thing that is um, impacting Caribbean coral reefs. I mentioned before that they are in peril. They're even more threatened now because of the introduction of this invasive species, um, the lionfish. Um, this is a beautiful fish, and you will see it in uh, aquariums around the world. Um, but it's also a very wicked fish. <laughs> it is venomous, and it has a potent neurotoxin um, in glands at the base of the dorsal fin that when it gets injected into a human um, causes an excruciatingly painful wound. And unfortunately, I know this from experience. That's my normally skinny little hand after getting hit by a lionfish spine while spearfishing for them um, off Belize. Um, <clears throat> So they, yeah, they belong in the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. Uh, but in the early 1980s, uh, they were re re uh, released into the Atlantic off of Florida. But they've now spread north to Rhode Island, west to Central America, and south to South America. And this is the projected uh, southern movement of them. But I can tell you, as of last week, 
They were found off Brazil, so we can color this in. So there's never been a marine invasion like this um, in the Caribbean, and there are a couple of differences in, uh, their, in their native Indo-Pacific waters. They're usually solitary, and in the Caribbean, sometimes we see them in large numbers. And in the Indo-Pacific, um, they inhabit shallow reefs, but off of Curacao, we have found them as deep as 660 feet. Now, these are voracious predators. Um, they have been clocked at eating up to 60 fish per hour. And when they're first introduced into a new area, they can reduce the local small fish population by 80%. They are eating machines. They'll even eat one another. Mostly, however, they like to eat other small fishes and invertebrates. But that's exactly what all of our new species on the deep reefs off of Curacao are. So my fear is that these predatory invasive lionfish and all of their great numbers are sitting down there on these barely explored deep reefs and they're gobbling up biodiversity before we even know that it exists. So we came up with a plan. Plan A was to go down with the Curasub and collect as many of these lionfish as we could and then bring them to the surface, cut the stomachs open, and then genetically analyze the stomach contents. We have DNA sequences for everything that we've collected off of the uh, Curacao Sea Aquarium so far, so we can see if these fish are eating known diversity or unknown diversity. But our plan didn't work, because unlike any other fish that we have targeted with the Curacao, these lionfish did not succumb to the anesthetic. You would squirt it at them, and they would do one of two things. One, they would just use the lights of the sub to keep eating. Or, <clears throat> more commonly, they would start swimming. And they would just keep swimming and swimming and swimming. It reminded me of the Energizer Bunny, where, you know, it just goes and goes and never stops. They would, they would never stop long enough to, uh, for us to hit them again with the anesthetic or to try to pick them up. So, plan B. Um, this is Bruce, he's one of the sub-pilots and he's the chief engineer of the Curacao. And he said, you know, these fish are really easy to spear when you're scuba diving, and they are. They just sit there. I mean, you can get your spear within inches before you fire. And he said, why don't we try spearing them with a sub? And so he rigged up this three-prong uh, pole spear. He's got the, the pointy end covered there for uh, until we get in the water. And the plan was we would go down with the sub and find a lionfish and then use this arm to pull a trigger and fire the spear. And believe it or not, it worked. Here's the first ever lionfish speared by a submersible. <laughs> Yay! But what was really great was when we got to the surface with this lionfish, um, Jeff Corwin, uh, who's the host of the ABC uh, TV series, Ocean Mysteries, happened to be on site with his film crew. Um, they were in Curacao to film uh, uh, coral spawning. But they had just wrapped up uh, fil uh, filming for a show called The Hunt for Lionfish. So they were ecstatic that we actually came up to the surface with this you know, lionfish on a spear from 400 feet or so. So Jeff interviewed me uh, dissecting the fish and, and talking about uh, uh, what we were doing and why it's important. Um, and that aired in February of 2015, I'm sorry, uh, February 15th, 2014. Um, but you may be able to see it as a repeat at some point. Um, but uh, anyway, we, we had four or five fishes in the stomach and a crab of that one fish. They all turned out to be known species, but we have the, we have the methodology down now. So we're going to be going back and trying to spear as many of these deep reef lion fish um, as we can. So stay tuned on the, on the results of that. One more thing about lionfish is that it is a delicious fish to eat. It has a firm white flesh, and we eat it as um, sashimi all the time, but it's also good as ceviche, fried, broiled, baked, grilled, any way you can think about eating it. And that's good news because um, marketing it commercially is probably going to be the only way to control the numbers of this uh, invasive species. Um, I live in Alexandria, Virginia, where there's a Whole Foods grocery store and I noticed in the seafood market a couple weeks ago, they had the um, invasive blue catfish, which has moved into the Chesapeake Bay. And so I asked them, I said, what about lionfish? And they said they're working on it. Um, one of the biggest issues has been um, because these, you know, these fish have those venomous spines, a lot of fishermen want nothing to do with them. Um, I, the, the experience 
experience I had, which was six hours of excruciating pain and swelling, and is is the minimum that you get from these. Some people, um, and some people, it causes paralysis, respiratory distress, and it, in rare cases, can even cause death. So, understandably, um, the fishermen don't really want to have anything to do with them. So, some organism, uh, some organizations such as Reef have started um, building and marketing these um, lionfish containment units. Um, and these are great because the reason that I got hit with a spine while I was spearfishing for them was that people typically take a mesh bag with metal handles down when they're spearfishing. And you get a fish on your spear, you open that bag, you stick the fish in, close the handles, pull the spear out, and that's how I got hit with those spines. But with these, these are PVC pipes. And the top end has these rubber uh, flaps going in. So when you get a fish on your spear, you put it into that containment unit, those flaps keep the fish in while you pull the spear out, the hands aren't anywhere close to the scene. Um, and then when you get to the surface, you just uh, unscrew the bottom and dump all your lionfish out. So, um, so hopefully the, the fishermen will start uh, catching these lionfish and uh, hopefully you'll start seeing them in seafood markets and in restaurants. And if you do, definitely try it. Um, not only delicious, but you're doing something good for the, um, the environment. <laughs> it's my little sustainable seafood speech for the night. All right, let me just end here um, with a few comments on some educational activities that uh, DROP has been involved with. If you go to ocean.si.edu, this is a Smithsonian's ocean portal. Lots of wonderful stories about research that we're doing in the ocean. But if you search for DROP, a dozen or so stories will come up about uh, what we're doing in Curacao. The Natural History Museum, where I work, um, last year opened a new education center called Curious. And one of the um, marine educators and I recently got a grant to create a virtual submersible dive. So we invited a 360 videographer to come with us to Curacao, and he did a lot of um, filming inside the sub, outside the sub, underwater. So what we're doing is we're creating um, a, uh, a computer, you know, simulated dive where um, the user can uh, take a tour of the sub inside and out and then go down on a dive and decide if they want to deploy an arms or catch a fish or, or take a picture. It should be great fun. Um, initially, it will only be in our Curious Education Center, but um, hopefully soon thereafter, we'll get it up on the ocean portal for anybody to um, play with. Um, Curious also last uh, year started a series of webcasts called Smithsonian Science How. And these are uh, live webcasts where students all over the country can tune in. And they, or a, there's a moderator who interviews a scientist. And then the kids who are watching can um, type in questions and the, the host scientists will um, answer the questions uh, right, right there and then. So I did one of these last April. It was fantastic. They have a, a phenomenal production crew putting these together. And if you go to the, uh, the, to the Curious website, all of the um, Smithsonian uh, Science How webcasts are archived there. So you can see mine and a lot of others. Uh, we just launched a new season of this a couple weeks ago. And the director of my museum, Kirk Johnson, who's a paleobiologist, um, was the guest scientist, and he was talking about the disappearance of dinosaurs and his work on uh, paleobotany. It's a great series. Um, we also have a, has a, a, have a video about DROP in the Field as Laboratory video series in the um, museum's Sant Ocean Hall. And then finally, we've been able to involve a lot of students in this work, from high school, college, graduate students, and uh, postdoctoral students. Um, and these are two uh, DC area high school students who were part of the Smithsonian's YES uh, program, Youth Engagement in Science, last summer. So here these young ladies are in DC in the DNA, in the DNA lab, genetically analyzing samples from deep reefs off of Curacao. So they had great time, and, and we enjoyed having them. Okay, um, if we, we have a few minutes, I'm going to show you this um, video real quick. There's no sound on this video, so um, it's just going to show you some, uh, a little bit of footage, and I'll just talk you through it as we go.
Okay, we're going to start in shallow reef. We're only at 69 feet here. We're looking out of the front of the sub, but look at the coral here. I mean, hurricanes don't hit Curacao, so the coral off of Curacao, the reefs are in a lot better shape than in uh, many parts of the uh, Caribbean. Um, this is a school of fish that's really common all the way down to 260 feet. They're so common they call them gringos. Um, <laughs> This is a, uh, a hogfish, H-O-G, hogfish. It's uh, related to wrasses. Any of you who are snorkelers or divers are probably familiar with trumpet fish. This is the closest relative of a trumpet fish called a coronet fish, and he's living down there almost 600 feet. Um, this is a beautiful uh, fish about this big called a big eye. Um, anytime you have sand and then you have like rock, you see life, and that's an octopus. That is an anemone, and you saw some sponges and other things there. Um, this is a boar fish, B-O-A-R, and again, anytime you have sand and then you have rock, you almost always see one or two of these, uh, these fish there. That is a big flounder. Um, you can see the size of the bottle right there. Um, we gave it, we put this species name on it. We didn't collect this yet, but the pigment pattern is a bit different from that species, so that might be something new as well. Um, so we'll have to try to collect one next time. We're down at almost 960 feet, this vertical wall. Um, there's another octopus. We, we, we videotape octopus a lot because they're just doing something. Um, this is a tile fish, T-I-L-E, and uh, these are quite big. We have been able to collect two of those with a sub. That's a sea robin, and its ventral fins are modified to form little leg-like appendages, and they just walk across the bottom. Um, this is, you'll see it in a second here, it's a very rare little yellow fish um, called a spike fish. There's a still image of it. You can um, get a better view of it there. Um, there's a group of fishes living under this ledge here that um, they're called lovelies. And if you get the light on them right, they really are. They're yellow and pink and orange. Um, this is a deep sea toad, and it's related to the angler fishes and also the monkfish you might be familiar with as seafood. But it has a lure right there between the eyes, uh, just like the, the deep water angler fish, although this one isn't luminescent. This is just a field of these red and white sea urchins. Um, almost every time we land on the bottom, it's different. And here was this, uh, this bed of urchins. This is a moray eel. Uh, they are not restricted to shallow reefs. This is a big eel, about that big around. Um, and I thought when I first saw this footage that um, this thing was trying to hide from the lights. But if you'll notice, it comes back out. And I think what it's actually doing is using the lights of the sub to forage for food. Um, there is a fish up here, a scorpion fish, and then there's a big jack. And we're down at 932 feet. So these jacks are coming all the way from the surface uh, down to these deep water depths. This is an arrow crab that's just making its way across the bottom. This is a roughy. If you're familiar with the seafood that was sold for a long time, orange roughy, before it became overfished, um, these get to be pretty, pretty nice size. Um, here's another scorpion fish. This one's trying to uh, hide under this ledge. We often just go down and squirt that quinaldine, that anesthetic. This is another scorpion fish, and this is what he was actually, he was sitting there upside down just like that. But we'll squirt quinaldine under the ledges and all kinds of things come out. That's where they like to hide. Um, but that's a beautiful octopus, and we were able to collect this one, and uh, hopefully we'll get a, um, a name on it, although the expert at the Smithsonian said he didn't recognize it, so probably 31 new species. Uh, <laughs> um, this green is a new species of uh, black coral, and these white things are crinoids. They're related to sea stars and sea urchins. They can get up, up, uh, get up and move around. Um, Sorry, that's jumpy, but there's that new species of flame scallop. Um, the scientist who described that gave it the name translucency. It has a, these translucent shells. Um, these are sea urchins, very common. We always tease about them being having parties because there's always a whole bunch of them. Um, these are also sea urchins, a different kind, and this is actually a poisonous sea urchin, um, very soft, and uh, we have to use gloves when we handle them. Uh, here you're just seeing what I already showed you before, that new species of brittle star um, that uh, is found on the bottles and the tires. 
And then here we're at 300 feet, and we just landed on this area. That was, there were fish everywhere. You can see a grouper here and a bunch of fish here, but here are three lionfish. We didn't get them on camera, but there were hammerhead sharks swimming around here, and big snappers. Um, now, we have just squirted this lionfish with that anesthetic, and he's sitting there eating. <laughs> so, I mean, these things, they are hardy. I mean, they are really hard to get. Here we're picking up a piece of wood and putting it into a, a collecting container. Anything that's living on the bottom like that will have stuff in it. Um, crabs, uh, uh, worms. So here we use the hydraulic arm of the sub to pull the arms unit off of the um, front of the sub and drop it down. Oh, and now you can see those U-bolts. Um, so here now we're going to retrieve one, um, and that's what it looks like once the lid is on and we're lifting it up. Here's what it looks like when we're trying to place the lid on there. We're trying to line up this latch with that U-bolt and then put it on there. And, uh, and I'm doing all this stuff with the arms with these little you know, toggle switches, and I wish I'd learned to do video games when I was young because I would be better at it than I am. But, um, here we've deployed a grass mat collector and it's just a, a, a doormat rolled up and wrapped up in a, a wire. We leave it out for six months to a year. Worms, mollusks, all kinds of things crawl in there. And that's a wood array, just pieces of wood put into a, a mesh basket and we leave it out for a year. And again, all kinds of things crawl in there and we retrieve it. Now, we're at 200 feet here, back up shallow, and look at this coral. This was a wall of coral, a plate coral, between about 200 and 300 feet. And I was so excited to see this because, um, we, like I said, we know very little about the condition of deep reefs. But this gives me hope that, um, at least in some areas, the deep reefs are in really good shape. And lastly, last month, I had a potential postdoc uh, who's applying to the Smithsonian um, come and bring this light trap down. And uh, this light trap uh, attracts the young or larval stages of fishes and invertebrates when they're settling out of the plankton and getting ready to settle on a reef. Um, and we tested the deployment of that light trap with the sub, um, so hopefully he'll be funded and can start contributing some of his good work to our um, drop research. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions. And I think Eric is going to... Yeah, raise your hand and I'll come by with a microphone. Uh, yeah. We have a live stream audience, so we want to capture the, uh, your question uh, on audio. Just be sure to hold the microphone close to your mouth. Uh, I've read about uh, ocean acidification oh, oh. and its effect on reefs, which I'm assuming are shallow reefs. Are you studying what effect it might have? I mean. Does that extend that far down? Is that going to be a problem as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, we are looking for uh, an ocean acidity monitor that we can deploy like we did those temperature loggers. They don't exist yet um, in terms of being able to just deploy something and leave it. Um, the, the guy who owns the sea aquarium has um, is just getting ready to start pumping water from about 400 feet up to the surface to feed his deep water tanks in the aquarium. And that's going to give us the opportunity to at least get surface and samples from 400 feet to start monitoring the ocean acidity. But um, about the corals, um, the one that you just saw there at the end between, the, I said it was between 200 and 300 feet, that's as deep as we get um, reef building corals. Okay, um, down deeper than that, there's not enough light to support the photosynthetic uh, algae that live in these corals and give them color. Um, you do get corals down deeper, but they're not reef building corals, they're solitary. So we're not going to have quite the same issue with the acidification in the deep, in the deep uh, reefs as we are in the shallow. That's really one of the major difference between, differences between the shallow and deep reefs um, is that you have reef building corals in shallow reefs and you, you lose those at about 300 feet. But other than that, the players are the same, sponges and fishes and lobsters and crabs and, and you name it. Dr. Baldwin here in the middle of the room. Thank you. Uh, two small questions. On that mother and baby fish, um, what happens to all its little spindly things as it grows? That's one. And, and related to the lionfish, how do you clean it? Okay. Um, 
First of all, I could give a whole talk just on those larval fishes because they are spectacular. Um, and, the, and most larvae of marine fishes don't look anything like the adults. So what you saw there is not an exception. That's pretty much the rule. And the reason is that these uh, when marine fishes reproduce, they, they spawn uh, pelagic eggs that uh, have an oil globule. They rise to near the surface, the larva hatches out, and they drift around in the surface currents for days to weeks to months, depending on species, before they settle out um, to wherever they're going to live. And because of that, they are inhabiting a very different evolutionary arena from the adult. And so what we observe are all these weird features in these larvae. That one with those big long fin rays probably is just making that larval fish look bigger. Um, and certain potential predators would have a problem with that. Some larval fishes have their heads covered with spines and maybe that makes them look less palatable. Um, some uh, larvae of some deep uh, sea fishes that are up in the surface, they have their stomach extending out, trailing way behind their body. Um, and uh, presumably that's for when they uh, are making the, the long you know, transition from the shallow down to the deep that they've got extra reserves you know, in, in their stomachs. There's another uh, larva of a deep sea fish that has eyes instead of on their head. They're out, way out on stocks. <laughs> But that would give them a better, you know, 360 vision for. So, but anyway, the in terms of what happens to these structures, the eyes end up back on the head, the gut ends up back in the body, and the in terms of those spines, um, I actually did a process called clearing and staining, where I can take a fish, and and clear the muscle tissue away with an enzyme, and then stain the bones red. And what I found that found is that the bone that's in those spines and those seven, it goes all the way out. It turns into a thread, but it goes all the way out. So we don't really know. Exactly. Surely the, the, the fish is growing into that to some extent, but whether that bone is actually being resorbed or whether they just fall off, we don't know. But it's fascinating. It's not just fishes. Um, you know, crabs and lobsters and a lot of marine invertebrates have weird looking larvae too, and then they somehow turn into what they're supposed to. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get to her second question. How do you clean a lionfish? Okay, so yeah, carefully, right. But uh, <laughs> you wear heavy gloves and you take uh, sturdy scissors and you cut that dorsal fin off. We cut all the fins off just to make sure. Um, and once you've done that, there's no issue with the toxin. Um, you can just fillet them like a regular fish. You had mentioned that there's some hope that there's a crossover, that the deep reefs can be a reservoir for, you know, fish that get overfished or otherwise, you know, lost from right. the shallow reefs. How, how much crossover have you seen so far in your genetic testing? Is there a lot of, you know, the same fish in the shallow as in the deep, or is it very separate yeah, domains? Yeah, there, there's definitely some of both. Um, we have found, depending on the, the, and it's not just fishes that we're thinking, you know, can do this, you know, cross between shallow and deep. I'm talking about um, some corals and sponges and everything. But um, for the fish uh, species that I work on, we have some that we have found from five feet down to 600 feet, one species. Um, and then we have others that are breaking up into like uh, 100 to 200 foot, you know, zones. Um, and then we have some that are just completely, you know, so there's a, so a little bit of, of everything. But, but that's one of the things that we're really looking at because um, like I said, the, the one species goes from 500, 5 feet to 600 feet. Well, sometimes when we find that, when we do the DNA, we actually find that it's not one species. Okay, so, um, so that's why we're trying to get samples of as many things as we can from as many depths as we can and genetically analyze them. We've got to get the species straight before we can, um, you know, make any sense of what you're asking. But I will also point out that um, one of my colleagues from our uh, Panama lab and I, um, in addition to collecting specimens, we're d regularly doing transects from a thousand feet to uh, the surface in that sub, and we have somebody in the back recording. We're yelling out species names and depths, and she's recording. So we are we are determining the upper and lower depth ranges of as many fish species as possible. Now what we can do, because we have this temperature data, we can correlate those two data sets and we can figure out the preferred temperature regime of these species. And over time, it wouldn't surprise me to see some of the shallower species moving deeper in response to the warming surface waters. Okay. On the uh, <clears throat> coral that's growing down at depth, do you find any of it needs uh, geothermal vents, you know, hot water vents? or? Uh, 
and do you see any correlation between temperature and the particular types of uh, coral you find at deeper depths? Right, so um, we have not, uh, the, the hydrothermal vents that you're talking about are much deeper than what we're working on. I think the shallowest one I know is about seven to 9,000 feet, and we're not going beyond 1,000, so I don't think we're gonna encounter that there. Um, and then uh, the temperature uh, really is, is uh, what I was mentioning before, that um, you only get you know, certain types of corals um, on the shallow reef that can extend down to uh, two or three hundred feet. And they do, the species do change as you go, but it's the same thing I was just saying. Some, they have some corals that can go, you know, uh, uh, five feet to three hundred feet and others that, that break up into zones. Dr. Baldwin on your right back here. Are some species so sensitive to pressure they can only exist at certain levels and do not survive if they're brought to different levels? Okay, that, that question about pressure is interesting. Um, most of the, we're, we're not talking about really deep sea here, okay? We're talking about, you know, fairly, fairly shallow relative to the, the depth of the 36,000, you know, feet uh, deep in the ocean. Um, so all of the fishes that we collect have uh, what's called a gas bladder or a swim bladder. And when we bring those to the surface in that sub, they blow up. That gas bladder expects, I don't, I don't mean blow up like blow up, they just um, puff up like a puffer kind of, you know. Um, but they don't survive that, okay. I mean if, uh, and, and that's, it's just because we're coming up through, you know, decreasing pressure as you mentioned and, uh, and that's just uh, as rapidly as we're coming up, they don't have time to, you know, uh, uh, equilibrate their, you know, swim bladder. So what the, what the owner of this sub is doing when he wants to keep things alive and I hate to say it they call me Dr. Death but I mean they're you know we we need the animals dead <laughs> because we can't you know we we can't describe a new species unless we have a specimen that's preserved and we can actually make all the counts and measurements and um, so I'm not proud of that but but it is an important part of what I do but this guy who owns a sub owns an aquarium and it's an important part of what he does to keep things alive. So he's been trying to figure out how to do this and so what he does is he collects fish the same way we do, they end up in that canister and then he has a diver that puts on the, a rebreather and uses mixed gas and he meets the sub at about 300 feet. And they take that canister off and they uh, leave it on the bottom and the next day that diver goes back, feeds the fish and brings it up 50 feet. The next day feeds the fish, brings it up 50 feet, so over a period of days, and it seems to be that 300 to where the biggest pressure change is between the surface and, uh, you know, those, uh, the shallower uh, parts of the deep reef is where the fish have the biggest problem. So he's successfully brought up uh, hundreds of, of fish specimens, and again, if you were to visit the Curacao Sea Aquarium, you would see deep reef fishes in his tanks. Now, someone had their, okay. So some organisms will move up and down with the light, either going to move up in, um, towards the light in the day or some even move up towards moonlight. <coughs> Are all the Cura sub dives during the day or have you done them at night? And if you've done them at night, have you seen different things? Well, I've only done two sub dives at night. And this is not because the sub can't dive at night. It's just that he has one crew and they're working all during the day and so he just doesn't have a separate crew. But, um, but the night dives are spectacular. And that's because the lights of the sub create this feeding frenzy of stuff. And there's just stuff dive bombing all, you know, across the front of that bubble. And it's so exciting. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to actually collect some of that stuff. You know, when we put the suction hose out there and just turn it on, it doesn't seem to work very well. So um, I think uh, uh, maybe like a little plankton net or something that we were, you know, pulling through um, when we were down at night would be good. But, um, but diving in the day, um, you do, it does get darker and darker as you go down. But I was just telling somebody at the reception that um, last month we did a test and we went down to about 950 feet. We we're on the sand bottom. We said, let's turn the lights off of the sub. We turned the lights off and we could still see at 950 feet. Now it wasn't great, but we could see boulders and it was actually easier for the pilots of the sub to navigate with the lights off because they had a broader field of, of uh, uh, view than with the lights on, which gives you this little, you know, narrow focus. 
We have a question at the back of the room, and due to the time, this will have to be the last question. Are you seeing completely different octopuses below 60, 600 just off there at Car uh, Curacao? Well, all of the octopuses that we've collected so far, three different ones. Um, the, the scientist at the Smithsonian who studies the shallow ones said he didn't recognize any of them. So, <laughs> so you know, we, I don't know yet. We, we are an, actually, uh, this week, we're analyzing the DNA samples from the octopus that we, um, that we just got on the past two sample, uh, sampling trips. So I'll know more in the future. But they, they certainly look different. I've never seen that, you know, as much snorkeling and scuba diving as I've done in the Caribbean. I've never seen that yellow orange thing before. Um, anybody know the score? I, yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> Two nothing Giants in the uh, second. No, I mean, I mean two nothing Kansas City. I've read that. One. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. The bases are loaded. One out. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. And thank you for attending tonight's lecture. I have, a, I have a note on our next talk will be November 11th with astronaut Chris Hadfield. That lecture has moved to Unity Temple on the plaza. And we have also added a private reception with Colonel Hadfield here at the Linda Hall Library from 5 to 6. The lecture will be at 7 at Unity. But there will be a reception here from 5 to 6. It's 5 to 6. It's 50 bucks. It includes a copy of his latest book, which you can get signed, and he'll be here to talk with you and get a picture with you, so it's well worth uh, the $50. So I hope to see you at both the reception and the lecture. So thank you and good night. <laughs>